Hello, good morning, and a very warm welcome to the Ilucidare Playground, turning a new page for heritage, co-organized by Europa Nostra in a partnership with Kia European Affairs and on behalf of the Ilucidare Consortium as the closing event of the three-year uh, Ilucidare project. My name is Lorena Aldana. I work as a European policy coordinator at Europa Nostra, and I am very happy to be with you today and uh, accompany you through the uh, rich and hopefully inspiring and interesting program that we have put together uh, to conclude and celebrate uh, the Ilucidare journey. Um, we are very happy to be here physically after such a long time, uh, despite the, the strike, uh, transport strike and everything else. And we are also very happy of the interest that this event has received. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have decided to open a second uh, listening room just next to us. So greetings to our colleagues over there as well, uh, who will of course have the opportunity to ask questions, share their thoughts and also exchange with this audience during the uh, networking moments. Very warm welcome also to our online audience watching us from uh, virtually all across Europe and uh, well beyond. We have had uh, over 200 registrations from, as I said, all over Europe and even Vietnam, Brazil, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, just to name uh, a few. So welcome. Please don't forget you can use the chat to communicate uh, with us and we will uh, hear you and uh, come back to you here uh, on site. Um, before we start with our program, I just wish to say a few words uh, on Ilucidare and on the aims of this uh, playground. As you probably know by now, or I hope, um, Ilucidare is funded by the Horizon 2020 program of the European Union. And uh, for the past three years, uh, we have been working on promoting cultural heritage as a resource for innovation and uh, cultural relations. So we have been doing this in many different ways, as you will see throughout the day, from conducting research to uh, rewarding excellence and also organizing knowledge sharing sessions all across Europe. Um, this has been made possible thanks to the cooperation um, between an international and European consortium of eight proud partners who are all uh, here with us today. The University of uh, Leuven, a project coordinator, Kia European Affairs, co-organizer of this event, International Cultural Center in Krakow, uh, World Monument Fund in Spain, Cultural Heritage Without Borders, Kosovo, University of Cuenca in Ecuador, and uh, Europa Nostra, based in The Hague and uh, in Brussels, and IMEC uh, based in um, Belgium as well. Uh, so with this event today, we want to take stock on what we have been doing for the past three years. So take stock on the Lucidare achievements and also disseminate further uh, these uh, results so that other projects, uh, policies and actors can uh, uptake and use them for their own benefit. As you can read in the name, we uh, also wish with this to turn a new uh, page for heritage uh, together with you. So the agenda, as you will see, uh, revolves around the Ilucidare learning outcomes, and we will put the spotlight really on the people, on the Ilucidare community that, uh, have, uh, that are behind uh, these uh, outcomes. Um, obviously, uh, we also wish to not only reflect on the past, but also uh, look forward to the future and discuss how we can use this knowledge and network uh, to, to, towards uh, the future. So uh, you will see uh, today we will present different um, products or uh, let's say practical tools that we have produced within the project to promote heritage-led innovation and international uh, relations. And also, we will hear the uh, thoughts, feedback, and reflections from the actors that co-created this or that have benefit, uh, benefited from this in any way. So we very much hope uh, that after to uh, today and with your help, we also think about how we can keep the legacy of the project, uh, Elucidare project, alive 
be it by mainstreaming it in our own work as partners or by facilitating uh, the, the replicability of Elucidare methodology and also uh, by uh, feeding uh, wider EU policy frameworks on heritage, innovation and international relations. So it's, a, it's an ambitious program, I hope you will enjoy it. And uh, to start the day uh, and to give you a flavor of what Ilucidare is about and what we have been doing for the past three years, uh, we have prepared a short uh, clip. This is it. We've spent the last three years building connections between people on the topic of heritage, sharing knowledge about our traditions and thinking about innovative projects. Heritage goes beyond borders. Our actions led us not only into Europe, but into the Western Balkans, North and Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. In each place, we conducted numerous coaching sessions, capacity buildings, and training courses. Our Elucidare experience map got implemented in co-creation workshops and was shared with businesses, NGOs, research, and education representatives. We didn't stop there. Our Elucidare playgrounds brought people together to learn and explore. We delivered special prizes for projects showcasing heritage-led innovation and in our national relations. Together with innovation practitioners, we shaped the first ever handbook on heritage-led innovation, showcasing no less than 130 European case studies. We're proud of the project's many achievements. Most of the accumulated knowledge during those three years will now be available in a single place, the Elusa Dare to Learn YouTube channel. We are proud to say we created connection between over 600 actors from all over the world and an online audience of more than 3,000 people. And now, Elucidare's legacy can last. Join us by putting heritage in the spotlight for innovation so our past can inspire and shape our future. Happy you like the video. And uh, as you have seen, uh, the three really key words uh, that we, we have heard and that will come back throughout the day are co-creation, connections, and capacity building. So I think these are three uh, really important concepts underpinning uh, Elucidare. Uh, and uh, now I'm very happy to give the floor to our very first speaker, who is uh, joining us online. Śnieska Khojalovic Mikhailovic, Secretary General of Europa Nostra, a proud uh, consortium partner and one of our co-hosts today. Śnieska, the floor is yours. Greetings to all of you, um, all the colleagues from all over Europe and understand from all over the world for attending this final playground. And I would like to greet you on behalf of Europa Nostra, the European voice of civil society committed to cultural heritage. And um, please accept my apology for not being with you in person because this week I have been representing Europa Nostra at the opening of the Biennale dell'Arte, which marks a true creative awakening of this unique city after the pandemic. And um, I have witnessed here a firework of exhibitions and encounters demonstrating the creative interaction between cultural heritage and contemporary art, including a stunning exhibition, Homo Faber, which celebrates the power of craftsmanship, both traditional and contemporary. And uh, I can tell you on the basis of these experiences, uh, we can really see that Venice and its Biennale are perfect ambassadors of the power of heritage to bring people together as a driver of international cooperation and of cutting edge innovation, which are at the, you know, the topics that are at the heart of the entire Illucidare project. So at the end of this exciting Illucidare journey, Europa Nostra is so proud, um, so proud of all that we have achieved together. We have been fortunate to build on existing partnership with our dear colleagues from the Leuven University and the International Cultural Center in Krakow, with whom we published the landmark report, Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe in 2015, as well as with our colleagues from the World Monuments Fund, more specifically those who are active in Spain. But this groundbreaking project has also brought us enriching new partnerships with CARE, the University of Cuenca in Ecuador, 
and cultural heritage without borders in Kosovo. While praising the work of other partners of our Elucidare Consortium, let me just point um, out Europa Nostra's most tangible contribution to Elucidare. And these are the Elucidare Special Prizes awarded within the European Heritage Awards, Europa Nostra Awards, uh, which we organized together with the European Commission in 2020 and 2021. As you know, the aim of our European awards is to promote the power of example. And that's why each of the Lucidare Special Prize winners provide powerful and meaningful examples for others to get inspired in Europe and beyond. They have shown how heritage can bring uh, cultural heritage professionals of all ages, and also including young people and even children, how they can bring them together across borders and in difficult circumstances, and how it can build, help build respect and understanding. It has shown that cultural heritage is a driver of interdisciplinary, innovative discoveries in the scientific field and in society at large, with multiple benefits beyond the world of heritage. In today's deeply trying time for Europe and the world, these success stories are a beacon of light and hope, a true inspiration and encouragement for us all. We indeed must continue building bridges. We must keep exploring and broadening our horizons beyond and above frontiers. We are very proud that the Lucidara Special Prizes have brought European and international visibility to the awarded and shortlisted project. We celebrating them last year here in Venice during a high level ceremony. And the winning projects have also benefited from tailored support from the Lucidare Consortium and international experts via the Champions Program and they are now part of the Irucidare community and part of the wider European Heritage Awards network of excellence. Moreover, the Irucidare Special Prizes winners have enriched all other outcomes from the uh, Irucidare project. They feature as good practices in the Innovation Handbook and International Relations Display, to name but a few. Likewise, the legacy of what we at Europa Nostra have learned from Milosidare is assured and will last for far beyond the end of this project. 2022 marks a new phase for the European Heritage Awards, Europa Nostra Awards, with newly defined categories that aim to more accurately and inclusively reflect the contemporary practice of cultural heritage. And we are proud to report that the key themes of cultural heritage-led innovation and international relations have been duly mainstreamed into our European Heritage Award Scheme. These important policy fields are also a priority in our strategic agenda, Horizon 2025, as we endeavor to increase our global outreach beyond the borders of Europe. Together with our consortium partners, we are certain that we will continue to build on our learnings from the Lucidare project. We also sincerely hope that all participants at today's meeting will benefit from the project's final uh, playground. Now, dear colleagues and friends, just to end, I would like first to applaud our team, the team composed of uh, uh, creative, hardworking, uh, people from all our members of our consortium. Of course, I also want to thank sincerely the European Commission, because obviously without them, this whole project would not have been able to uh, see the light of the day. Uh, uh, the, we thank the Horizon uh, 2020, now Horizon Europe program for the funding of this project. And um, more generally, we thank also the European Commissioner who will address us in a minute uh, for uh, her 
very important also political and policy support. And I'm delighted that after we will also hear uh, Gaia Danese from the European uh, External Action Service who will uh, address this meeting. It clearly shows how important and how much um, uh, we have a good relationship between the institutions of the European Union and the, the heritage professional institutions and the civil society organizations that have been involved in this project. And um, last but not least, dear colleagues and friends, um, I definitely cannot end my, um, my opening words without, without expressing uh, our solidarity. Our solidarity is with Ukraine, with their citizens, and more specifically with their cultural heritage defenders, as we are today having our playground, talking about heritage-led innovation, um, how not to think um, about uh, um, what they are going through, um, uh, the Russia's brutal and illegal uh, invasion of the country um, has, put, has, has put so much at stake, uh, has shown uh, in a painful way um, how fragile peace is uh, in Europe and also in the rest of the world, and also how fragile our cultural heritage is definitely in times of war, but also uh, in, times, in times of peace. And the reason more that we all have to join our forces and, and our voices to mobilize ourselves in order to, uh, to, to preserve uh, cultural heritage, in order to be able to develop uh, the sort of um, innovative and um, um, cultural had led innovation and international relations in Europe and the rest of the world. And um, I mentioned that I'm in Venice this afternoon. Uh, Italian uh, Minister of Culture, Dario Franceschini, will open together with the Ukraine Minister of Culture, the Ukrainian pavilion here at Biennale de Rate, again showing a strong message of the role, role, key role of art, uh, culture, cultural heritage as a as a sort of antidote to um, to violence, war, uh, hatred, and um, so. And also, I want to add that all of us we uh, should uh, mobilize in order to help our colleagues in Ukraine. We have modestly uh, sent um, a launch together with Global Heritage Fund, uh, um, a fundraising, a, a crowdfunding for um, cultural heritage defenders in Ukraine. Uh, I would like um, uh, my colleagues to share the link with that crowdfunding initiative with the participants of this playground. Please contribute, to, uh, spread, it, spread the word around, um, however symbolic, however small, but it will be meaningful and, and, and help our, um, our colleagues to, um, in, to have a, a series of uh, preventive and emergency measures in their countries, but also together with the European Union, we are sure that we will be able, once the war is over, to um, include also cultural heritage among the priorities within the recovery plans for Ukraine. So with all this, let me uh, once again greet you all, wish you a very innovative, creative um, experience during this playground. And um, uh, I look forward to um, hearing about its outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nesca, for your enthusiastic uh, words as, uh, as usual and for uh, the solidarity expressed also towards our uh, colleagues and uh, citizens of Ukraine who are uh, facing uh, hardship. And this is a very concrete example indeed of heritage-led uh, international uh, relations, what you just mentioned, the crowdfunding campaign. Um, thank you also for uh, highlighting the interdisciplinarity and the international uh, dimension of our project, which we uh, will talk about uh, later on, and uh, for the important uh, mention to the European Commission, which uh, leads me to our uh, next speaker. Um, very special video message from uh, the European Commissioner for Innovation, uh, research, culture, and youth, Maria Gabriel, who could uh, not join us today, but uh, wanted still to convey her greetings. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to address you today, and I would like to thank the organizers for offering me this possibility. 
Cultural heritage brings us together. It helps strengthen social cohesion, foster tolerance and mutual understanding, supports the development of sustainable tourism or the establishment of hubs of cultural and creative industries. It has the potential to create local employment and improve the quality of life. Additionally, it engages a variety of stakeholders and heritage professionals around the world. It is this openness to the world that is in fact one of the main objectives of the Horizon 2020 project Illucidare. Launched during the European Year of Cultural Heritage in 2018 and led by the University of Leuven with a European contribution of 2.9 million euro, the project truly stands at the intersection of our priorities on culture-led social innovation, heritage protection and cultural diplomacy. The Elucidare project showcased the huge potential of our cultural heritage to act as a catalyst for creativity and innovation. At a moment when we are witness of the aggressive Russian invasion in Ukraine, it demonstrates the capability of the heritage world to foster human solidarity and cross-country cooperation. And I would like to express my solidarity with the Ukrainian people as well as with all those involved in heritage and cultural sector in Ukraine. We are preparing a dedicated action on sharing expertise and boosting capacity building among Ukrainian cultural professionals for the restoration of their cultural heritage. I applaud the efforts of all the stakeholders, cultural and heritage professionals, innovators behind the Elucidare project. What we have achieved is very impressive. 100 core stakeholders who have been directly involved in the project activities and more than 400 European and non-European organizations working in research and innovation, preservation of heritage, international cooperation. And I wish to thank Europa Nostra from their significant contribution in so many heritage projects to their work on Lucidaria Awards. They continue to act as multipliers and they deserve our greatest thanks. I would like also to reaffirm our commitment to continue supporting the development of cultural heritage research projects. Through Horizon Europe, we support the cultural heritage through the first ever cluster dedicated on culture, creativity and inclusive society with a budget of above 2.3 billion euros. It aims at increasing the understanding, the preservation, the restoration and the transmission of cultural heritage. It will also support the cultural and creative industries in doing so. These research and innovation activities strengthen the innovation capacity of the cultural and creative industries. A concrete example is the new European Bauhaus. We are also preparing the creation of a European cloud platform for museums and other cultural heritage institutions. Such platform will allow our common heritage to be resilient and accessible to all. Finally, Horizon Europe is not the only European program active in this domain. The new Creative Europe program for the first time ever envisages a new sectorial approach addressing the specific needs of cultural heritage. It will promote innovative approaches to content creation access, distribution and promotion across cultural and creative sectors through creative innovation labs. And finally, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology complements these investments through its new knowledge and innovation community dedicated to cultural and creative sectors this year. To conclude, I would like to congratulate you once more for the Elucidare success. As we are currently celebrating the European Year of Youth, allow me also to stress the role that young people have regarding cultural heritage. I'm proud to see that many past projects shortlisted for the special prize are putting the focus on youth. It shows that cultural heritage is not something from the past. It continues to shape our present and will be a driving force of our future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Gabriel, for the words of appreciation uh, towards the work of Elucidare. 
and for the uh, overview of uh, what the European Commission is doing to support and to invest uh, in cultural heritage as a resource of human solidarity, knowledge, innovation and creativity. I am uh, very pleased to invite our next speaker, Gaia Danese, Cultural Diplomacy um, Advisor at the European Commission External Action Service, who will be joining us online. Welcome, uh, Gaia. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, absolutely uh, delighted to be here with you today, even if just virtually. Uh, I think it is absolutely important to recognize and uh, stress the value of projects such as uh, Illucidare. Um, I, will, uh, I will just uh, start to, um, with um, referring to some key words that then uh, uh, will be explained a little bit in my presentation. Uh, why uh, do I think that this is a, a very useful, important um, and milestone project? Uh, first of all, because of its value of mainstreaming uh, the concept of cultural heritage and of cultural relations uh, into a wide range of actions and initiatives. Secondly, um, the project is based on some uh, fundamental concepts, which are fair collaboration, um, co-creation, um, a, um, a bottom-up approach, which is based on capacity building, and uh, the establishment of good practices, uh, the creation of toolbox, toolkits, which makes all of these projects a, a really sustainable action, which means an action that can uh, last in time. Um, all of this, it's, it matches absolutely uh, the, the, uh, the idea and the strategy of uh, uh, the international cultural relations and cultural diplomacy that uh, uh, the, the European Union is being uh, building up uh, since uh, a few years. So uh, you know that there are some relevant documents uh, on the, uh, of these three very important documents which are the joint communication of 2016, European Council conclusion of 2019. Uh, the third one is the most relevant for cultural heritage, which is the Council conclusion on the protection of cultural heritage in conflict and crisis of 2021. Those documents shape three axes uh, of action and the strategy. The first one is considering culture as an engine for uh, um, uh, lasting, uh, uh, lasting development. The second one is um, promoting culture and dialogue uh, and, 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 um, and intercultural dialogue uh, to foster uh, peaceful relations peaceful international relations. The third one is uh, reinforcing the protection of cultural, for cult of cultural heritage. As you may see, uh, Illucidare mm, uh, matches perfectly these, uh, these three, these three axes. So uh, really uh, congratulations for, for, for the, the work you've done in shaping this, uh, this project. Um, I would like to uh, now uh, uh, stress a little bit the reasons that make more than ever the action on uh, cultural, I mean, the, 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 the initiative in cultural uh, uh, driven international relation um, and especially based on the protection of cultural heritage, absolutely urgent and uh, uh, relevant. The first one is that there, there are uh, the numbers of conflicts and crises are raising. We are saying this uh, in every occasion. It is a, a sad reality, but it is what is going on. Then there are uh, uh, transverse challenges, uh, challenges as climate change and uh, the whole question of sustainability of our model of development, not just uh, uh, for third country, also inside Europe. 
And then, as you all know, European values are being more and more contested uh, by authoritarian regimes all over the world. Um, this is why uh, uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, is uh, an enormous value that we have to look after, care for, uh, as I said before, on a fair basis, which means that uh, it's not uh, thinking that our European cultural heritage is superior to others, but uh, um, it is uh, be, be aware of uh, its value and the fact that it is uh, it defines Europe as a multilateral uh, democratic actor and then uh, uh, capable of interacting on a peer-to-peer -peer basis uh, and learning also from other different cultural heritages around the world. Um, I, um, I, the, so the time for action uh, is come and it's more and more pressing. Um, for, for this renewed action in international cultural relations, there is, um, in order to make it a real uh, a joint value to what member states already do, because we don't have to forget that uh, cultural relations uh, are uh, mm, uh, a first competence of member states, uh, but uh, if uh, the European Union can really bring an added value, it is by redefining uh, the spectrum of cultural relations in a broader way so that it, uh, it can support a cross-cutting approach, a transversal approach, uh, and really become a political priority. So. Uh, this is another myth that we need to, uh, um, uh, to um, let's say, to, to, to leave behind. And it's the myth of the soft power. It is not about being soft. It is, not about, it is about, on the contrary, considering culture an enormous strength uh, and to make it a strategical uh, asset for Europe. Uh, a political priority. But on the other hand, uh, it is uh, in this new approach, there is a strong need of a people-to-people -people approach based on reciprocity, on mutual learning, co-creation, uh, which uh, will, uh, which has to uh, um, uh, include uh, the third sector, civil society, each and every citizen uh, and the cities they are uh, they are uh, living in. Uh, it is crucial the role of cities and citizens is, and citizens um, uh, because they have to be the main actors of cultural international relations. Um, and here again, uh, uh, projects like this one uh, you are pre you are presenting the results today are a clear example of uh, uh, how beneficious this kind of approach can be. Uh, it is time so to really uh, promote the cultural relation, the relations outside the European Union uh, and as a political tool. And this may be done only by uh, creating a, a clear calendar of initiatives uh, which are sustainable, which are not just one spot initiatives. The creation of networks and clusters is crucial in the cultural field. And as I was saying before, the mainstreaming of culture in external action and in cooperation uh, for development policies. Once again, you may see how Elucidare meets all these needs in the way the project is conceived and implemented. Um, as you may know, there is a lot that has been done. Uh, I mean, Commissioner Gabriel already explained uh, so many things in her, in her, inter, in her uh, intervention. Uh, what I would like just to stress very quickly is that uh, the main achievement have been the establishment of a cooperation between many services and, and DGs uh, uh, of the Commission, like EAC, INPA, NIR, with the uh, European external services. Um, 
a close cooperation with member states in a, in a continued dialogue uh, with senior official meetings, for instance. The creation of a network of cultural points in the, in the uh, European Union delegations abroad and also uh, a good partnership with other actors such as UNIQ, such as also uh, UNESCO and organization of, uh, of uh, civil society. Uh, I, I will quote Europa Nostra for, for sure, uh, but there are many others. Uh, Europa Nostra is uh, especially important for us uh, because of its broad capacity uh, to reach out uh, in the field of, of cultural heritage, but also in the field of a political uh, idea of uh, uh, the, the, the employment of cultural relations. So thank you very much to, to Europa Nostra. And, um, and then uh, there, is, there, there is a cultural relations platform, as you know, uh, uh, which, is, uh, 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 which has been fostering very interesting projects uh, like the Global Cultural Relations Program from young cultural readers across the globe. Um, yet there are, uh, and the mainstreaming of culture in, in, uh, in international relations has also started with, especially with heritage, cultural heritage protection. Uh, I will quote uh, our EU civilian advisory mission in Iraq that had a very important aspect of cultural protection. Uh, Again, the Council conclusion on the EU approach to cultural heritage and conflict and crisis, uh, they are a key document in that sense. Um, so um, what we are now really doing is working on how to integrate the cultural heritage in the various facets of conflicts, like and I mean by preventive actions, safeguarding measures, and recovery and rehabilitation. There is a lot to do, and we need the civil society to be with us. It's absolutely important because again, anything that will come uh, uh, top down will not be as effective as, the, as what comes bottom up. Um, there are challenges. I will not, <laughs> I will not uh, uh, hide this from you. Uh, those challenges have to, to do with uh, things that we discuss is, uh, uh, Mm, um, we discussed this recently, and Sneska was also there in a very interesting hearing that was promoted by the Economic and Social Committee. Um, and uh, they have to do with the fact that coordination is not perfect. We still have to implement more coordination inside the Commission and between the Commission and the European External Service. Uh, that there is a need, and I absolutely I absolutely agree with that, with this idea of an action plan. I think we should go for it. And I will, uh, and I will uh, uh, ask our Secretary General also to, to see if we, if we can personally commit with this idea, because I think it is very important. Then there, there are also uh, uh, the problem of financing, uh, the problem of human resources. As you know, at the European External Service, we're very few, we're, we're a very small cultural team. But very active. Uh, we should. We we are now starting to work very closely with, with FPI also, uh, in order to uh, get our um, project financed, uh, also a little bit inside the house, and also about financing, but not only finance financing commitment. It is important to have the private sector committed to all these tasks, especially in cultural heritage. Uh, Thank you. Um, you can, I mean, it, you can definitely sorry? count on us to support you. Uh, you say you you need the support from uh, from the civil society, from the cultural world. So you can definitely uh, count count on us for that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gaia. Thank you for reminding us also about the importance of uh, fair collaboration, of equal to equal uh, relations, uh, bottom up um, uh, 
uh, relations and exchanges as the real basis for international uh, relations based on cultural heritage, which is what uh, Ilucidare uh, stands for. So thank you, uh, Gaia, thank you, uh, Schnieska, and also Commissioner Gabriel uh, for sort of setting the tone uh, in terms of uh, policy context. And now uh, it is time to um, hear the voices of the Ilucidare project, so the voices from within. And um, we have two inspirational speakers here with us today. They have been involved in the Lucidare project in different ways. They are uh, heritage experts. And um, I will introduce uh, first uh, Tiago Candellas, who is the project manager of Mi Momo Faro project, which stands for Minecraft and the Modernist Architecture in Faro. He is also a proud uh, Europa Nostra ESSEC, European uh, Heritage Young Ambassador, and uh, he's here with us to share his uh, view on uh, Elucidare and the way forward. Tiago? So thank you, Lorena. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, so uh, I will start talking about my journey in the Lucidare project. So it started in July, uh, last July in Krakow, as I was one of the lucky uh, participants in the life-changing experience that was the summer school on heritage and innovation. And then, things happened, and then I was here as well on, <laughs> on the last playground, Heritage Voices Out, um, sharing a panel with the Zillis about the Innovation Handbook. And then we are here uh, trying to make an inspirational speech um, <laughs> about heritage and innovation and um, about what I'm doing right now. So when I talk about heritage and innovation, uh, I think about having new ideas, uh, creating new knowledge, um, things that, can, uh, that are able to stand out from the other projects on the other initiatives, um, putting heritage at the center of our work, and of course, making it in a different way. Um, and that's uh, the point. So we knew that at work, we knew that Minecraft was being used, uh, for example, for educational purposes uh, with the Minecraft Education Edition, and as well in urban planning and co-design processes related to heritage. So what we thought about was why not putting these two dimensions together, because we believe that the best way we can learn is by playing, especially uh, the young ones. So we tried to put together education and heritage with Minecraft to create a heritage education project. Um, and then we uh, thought, why not to put it together with modernist architecture? Because uh, it's not usual, at least in Portugal, when we talk about heritage, to think about modernist architecture. And we, uh, uh, a colleague of mine and I, we, we, we proposed to, to do this project and people were like, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> we're not doing that. And apparently, uh, we were not that crazy. <laughs> we were a bit crazy, but we were not that crazy. That it, it happened that we created the My Momo Faro project, which joins Minecraft and the modernist architecture in Faro. So we challenged uh, the young people, we challenged schools and teachers to recreate the modernist buildings in Faro in Minecraft while they were learning the expected subjects at school. And it happened that, of course, we faced some challenges, some difficulties, because at first, teachers, stakeholders, they were like, games in school. <laughs> to learn and to teach how it is possible and how can we articulate that with the school curricula. So, and one of the bigger questions was, but modernist architecture is considered to be uh, uh, heritage. And that's, that was the point because we wanted to uh, make a difference and not working on uh, 
usual types of heritage like churches, palaces. We wanted really with this project to um, change the mindset regarding modernist heritage. And then we told them, yes, we can do that. Let's try it. You just have to trust us. And <laughs> then we um, had another different challenges because People were not in the uh, correct mindset. They were not, uh, teachers were not in the mindset to use a game in school. Um, they were not looking at modernist architecture as heritage. And even the stakeholders were not prepared to um, implement and test a project like this because they were looking at me and my colleague, oh, uh, you're too young to, <laughs> to propose a project uh, like this. So we did a, capac a capacity building uh, with a training course for the teachers on how to use Minecraft in schools and how to explore the modernist architecture in Minecraft. And of course, we uh, overcome these challenges by researching, testing, trying, adapting, and of course, by trusting. They, we had to trust ourselves and they had to trust us that we were able to do this. And this because we were believing that we were able to do that. And because when we believe things happen and it happened and it went really well. Um, and I, I'm here with a statement from a famous uh, Brazilian modernist architect. Uh, I started my master thesis with this statement, which is we have to dream if we don't, things don't happen. So if, if I'm here trying to inspire someone, <laughs> what I would like to say to uh, young heritage professionals and to heritage innovators is that keep dreaming and keep believing because when you keep dreaming and believe it, you can make it different and you can make it happen. And of course, I'm, I was not able to be here talking about uh, or doing an inspirational s uh, speech without thanking Elucidari team for inspiring us, especially us in the summer school, uh, to, be, to become better persons, better professionals, to dream and to be able to believe that we can make it. And of course, I, I cannot talk about, um, I cannot be here trying to inspire you without thanking a lot to my fellow mates from the summer school because they inspired me a lot. Uh, they were, pushing me so to be here today and um, I know from you guys that I believe that we have a bright future ahead and that we can face wh what we are facing right now in the world and I hope that we, were, uh, we will be able to do it together. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tiago, for uh, your enthusiasm and also for uh, reminding us that it's not uh, always easy. We also talk about the resistance to innovation. So you have to uh, keep, uh, as you say, keep dreaming, keep, uh, keep going on. And uh, our, yeah, thank you very much. Our second inspirational speaker is uh, Joe Callas who is an architect, restorer, member of SIPA Heritage Documentation Emerging Professionals and member uh, of the advisory committee of our World Heritage Initiative. Joe, I see you. I uh, thought I would <laughs> call you the floor is yours. So it's the green one? Okay. So first, thank you, Lorena, thank you, Ilish Daria, and thank you, Azilis, for inviting me and giving me, again, the chance to uh, speak to the wider pub, uh, public about my experience in documenting Beirut. So today I will be talking about, uh, so the slide starts, okay, about heritage-led innovation and international relations uh, role into decision-making and preservation of, uh, of heritage. And to do so, I will rely on my experience into documentation, emerging documentation of Beirut right after the explosion that happened on August 4. So just to give you a little bit of context, 
so yeah, the explosion happened on August 4 on the northern part of the uh, international port of Beirut, uh, unfortunately uh, generating damages to a wide diameter of 15 kilometers around the city and other areas. Unfortunately, the, red, uh, the zone marked in red here is the zone that has the most considered to be the historic center is the zone that has the most number of historic uh, buildings uh, now. Uh, and you can see how the explosion generated several damage to historic churches, historic buildings, mansions, palaces, and residential buildings uh, in the area. Uh, yeah, so for me, even though despite the, the misery and the disaster, I found it like also an opportunity, if I can say, <laughs> to transfer Beirut finally to the digital world because if you don't know, Beirut is one of the less documented cities in the world. There was never a massive digital documentation of historic buildings. There was never a heritage focused or related GIS that was done before. So, and yeah, I wanted to do that. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, so right after the explosion, two days after the explosion, a vol volunteering initiative uh, was created, which is Beirut Built Heritage Rescue 2020. Uh, it was created to support the Director Gen uh, General of Antiquities, the DGA, uh, to assess the buildings, to identify heritage buildings, and it was directly supported by ECOMOS, UNESCO, ICROM, Blue Shield, and other local uh, institutions. So as an architect restorer who volunteered with this initiative, I, um, I decided to, to, to volunteer and document and implement the three documentation mission of uh, uh, of Beirut to uh, to be able to help to accelerate the preservation of the buildings and also to uh, to, uh, to document them uh, so and one of the other motivation for me unfortunately after the civil war of Beirut that ended in the 90s in the beginning of the 90s a lot we lost a lot of heritage buildings not because they were affected by the war but because <laughs> of modernization and globalization developers uh, started demolishing intentionally a lot of historic buildings to you know to build a lot of uh, towers uh, skyscrapers hotels you name it <laughs> unfortunately and you can see uh, those contrast photos that i like but also that i hate <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so this photo that I took right after the explosion with the drone, uh, it shows, you can see this small green paradise down there, just surrounding by this uh, horrific scene behind, for me at least. Uh, so this is the Surso Palace, one of the very few remaining, uh, you know, uh, residential uh, private palaces in Beirut and in the region. So let me take you back to the 1920s, what you can say on top of the hill, the only landmark of the city when you come from the Mediterranean Sea was the Surso Palace whereas now it's surrounded by countless, meaningless, lifeless towers that, you know, uh, <laughs> are there now, unfortunately. So I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to, so I saw, in uh, I saw in technology a tool to accelerate the preservation of those buildings, of course, and the way to doc document them in case of any intentional uh, vandalism act. So the goals of the mission were, of course, one, to report the current state of the buildings after the explosion, uh, to provide accurate uh, 3D models to accelerate and facilitate the structural analysis uh, and emergency interventions, to provide graphical models uh, and drawings to facilitate the generation of decay mapping and or restoration files to, 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 to start applying for funds, and of course to provide graphic and scientific documentation of the buildings uh, as a record for posterity. With that, of course, a lot of challenges uh, <laughs> come. So first was just time. I didn't have the luxury of time because it was a responsibility because I wanted to document them before we do the int any, uh, any kind of in uh, consolidation intervention. So we, if I don't document at the right time, we might lose buildings. Uh, and that the resources, Lebanon is passing through a huge economic crisis other than the pandemic, other than explosion. So, uh, and funds weren't coming at the beginning. So we had to rely on our own resources and uh, our own tools, our own everything we have. So I wanted to do the best with what we have instead of saying, oh, we don't have this, we cannot do that. So uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and it was like during a huge wave of the pandemic. So also circulation wasn't that uh, easy. And also security because, you know, everything is damaged. Everything is like unstable and it it could be very risky to just enter those buildings. Uh, as for the planning, so it was an emergency situation that needs, of course, a very efficient and fast documentation. This, relies, this relied on two uh, items. One, the available tools. In the case, it was like my own camera and the drone that was provided by the Director General of Antiquities. Of course, the laser scan would have been very helpful for the documentation of the interior spaces, but unfortunately, we didn't have that. It cost too much <laughs> to just rent it, so 
yeah, we did the best with what we have, of course. <laughs> uh, so and, uh, it relies also on available computer configuration. Also, I didn't have the workstation, so I relied on my own laptop with, uh, with just 16 gigabytes memory, so, <laughs> so which gave me a limitation of 300 photos. But this is what I like about technology. There's never obstacles. You can always find turnarounds. And also, I found turnarounds from increasing the virtual memory of my laptop to make it perform more than he can, actually. <laughs> and uh, you, you know, using the right software, adapting it, adapting it to my needs, and also you know, uh, uh, using some Python scripting and coding to make uh, a smart processing of the models instead of just processing the, uh, the usual way. So in that way, I was able to document with 800 photos, 1,000, and also some building 1,500 photos. Uh, and it was great <laughs> for me. Uh, so yeah, the mission was divided into two uh, like submissions. We have the high-risk buildings and the medium-risk buildings. The high-risk building, I wanted to take care just myself without involving anyone else because was they were very risky and I didn't want to uh, cause any uh, danger to anyone. So it was me and one DJ Asif who was the drone operator. And we documented 40 buildings that were the most highly risked in the area. And the medium-risk buildings also, so it involved me. And I also I organized a small capacity building for 12 architects architecture students that I'd made them love photogrammetry and <laughs> digital documentation. And I, gui I guided them through exactly to document more than around 265 buildings, less affected buildings in the area. So here you can see some screenshots of some of the 40 highly risk buildings that I documented. And you can see in some, pic in some pictures the extent of the damages that were uh, that was caused to the structure of the buildings, the integrity of the buildings. Uh, yeah. And this is very unfortunate for Beirut, especially with what we, we lost earlier. Um, and here you can see also a small animation uh, video of animation of some of the buildings that I documented. Uh, and actually, for the ge georeferencing of uh, of the buildings, each case was has its each building was its own case because uh, I didn't have always uh, the possibility to adapt uh, one method to, ev to everywhere because of the d of the damages. So sometimes we were using uh, coded targets. Sometimes I was using uh, you know, uh, scales. Sometimes I used urban elements to scale and reference the building. So it depends on what was accessible, what was less dangerous. And uh, yeah, so also you can see the extent of the damages on uh, a lot of those buildings. Uh, and again, this is all in the uh, historic center of, uh, of the city. So yeah, at the output, so the idea was, okay, of course, yay, we documented. <laughs> but the idea, of course, was uh, I want to generate, you know, accurate plans and elevations uh, with like, with a few photos and few, I was able to generate good quality uh, elements that was, uh, that was also very helpful, not just for the documentation, but also it helped a lot to implement the emergency, uh, emergency intervention, like the propping dimensions were taken uh, quickly right from the, you know, from, from the outputs. And also for the, I generated all the photos of the pitch truth to quickly implement the sheltering mission, which was also, so here I was saying, okay, I forgot all the efforts, all the tiredness, everything. I was like, yeah, yeah, the documentary is paying off. What I'm doing, it's paying off, and it's great. We're helping Beirut. We're trying, to, we, technology made a difference here. So, yeah. And also, I was generating classifying point clouds and generating scalar fields to also provide structural engineers with, you know, uh, some elements that show out of plane deformations or, you know, leaning uh, problems so them to, to know how to intervene and where to, interv where to intervene first. So, of course, and documentary is not just exterior, so there's the interiors, and so some palaces with very highly valuable, you know, ceilings, uh, and decorative uh, ceilings with, you know, uh, uh, high value. And also, I want to document the interiors with the damages before cleaning, before putting the documentary, because this will help later uh, in the, you know, the, uh, to analyze how the buildings reacted at how, or how the explosion reacted inside of the city. And also, provide that we have now document all the elements that as they are, as they fell, so we can recreate new elements in case we, didn't, we weren't able to use the old ones. Even the smallest wooden decorations were docu documented to be able to recreate them later and implement them as they were. So yeah, at the end, I just want to uh, address a few words to the uh, young professionals in the field of heritage and tools. Uh, we can make the world a better place <laughs> using the right technology the right way we can make a difference. In my case, using a drone and a camera, I was able to document Beirut's heritage, to accelerate the preservation and consolidation of those buildings, and now to start restoring it. So imagine what you can do. And with technology, we have no limits. Uh, so I just want to end with a, uh, with a quote for Martin Luther King, for, for me, always inspires me to surpass my limits. If you cannot fly, then run. If you cannot run, then walk. And if you cannot walk, then crawl. 
whatever you do, just keep moving forward. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Joe and Tiago, for your energizing uh, speeches uh, this morning. Uh, also, thank you to our online audience who uh, keep uh, commenting and sending greetings from uh, Sarajevo to from uh, Tunisia. So uh, thank you very much. Please uh, remember that uh, you can ask questions, uh, write your comments, and we will uh, throughout the day continue to interact with you. Um, thank you also to our uh, two inspirational speakers for really opening the, the, the way to our two uh, key topics, which are innovation and international uh, relations. So with this, I would now uh, introduce the first panel uh, discussion of the morning uh, on heritage-led international relations entitled Beyond the Obvious, Heritage Can Bring Innovation Where You Don't Expect It. So, uh, to, introduce, uh, to introduce this panel, we will have uh, Jimena Quijano, Research Associate at Q11, together with Asilis Van de Sande, Elucidare Scientific Coordinator, who will uh, give a, a, an introduction on the learnings of Elucidare, and will uh, then welcome uh, the rest of the panel on stage. Thank you, Lorena, and hello, everyone. And thank you to our inspirational speakers. That was very inspirational indeed. So now we are going to dive into a bit more of content. Uh, just to correct, maybe, is uh, the panel on innovation first, uh, beyond the obvious. Uh, so we just want to maybe remind you about the working definition of heritage-led innovation. We know you have seen it already, maybe in our innovation handbook on or some of our events, but we are going to sh uh, show a short clip so you can remember, and then we will go into the conversation. years of research, creation, and development. The Elucidare project is coming to an end with a major outcome to share, defining the role of heritage and innovation and international relations. Heritage-led innovation is the implementation of a new idea rooted in heritage that creates value or improves existing conditions. The innovation process begins with new knowledge found at the intersection of disciplines and ideas. It is made available to others, enabling us to determine the success of the innovation and whether the idea is truly new and an improvement over the current situation. Found out more on our Elucidare to Learn YouTube channel. You can get a bit closer, maybe? closer to me. I'm trying to fix this. Okay, good. Uh, so this was very, very short, uh, the clip. Um, so yeah, if you want to uh, know more about it, uh, we have a lot of information in our innovation handbook and YouTube channel. So this is just, I think, a very short reflection of all the research uh, that we did. Um, and one part of the research that we did uh, was basically uh, mapping about 131 cases that fit all the different components um, of our innovation definition. Um, and um, to each of the cases that we mapped, we also assigned some pestle categories, um, which is basically, um, maybe if we can already see the, yeah. the Mentimeter, my microphone. Yeah, so we will, we will do uh, one question for you so we'll need your help um, we will see a QR code for those who are on site you need to scan it with your phones please and for the online audience they will have a link somewhere that you can click let us know if it's is if it's working yeah, just yeah, give us a shout uh, if it's working. No? Maybe we can show the QR code again. Oh, that's me. No. <laughs> 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 it's also important. Huh? Yeah. You so can also go to, to www.menti.com and enter the code, but if you can scan this also it's maybe faster. easier. Okay. So I see people with the phone up. That's yeah, so sign. then we can maybe show the question is, which factor do you think influenced the heritage sector the most? 
The this factors mean? are the ones associated to the pestle, so political, economic, uh, social, technical, yeah. legal. Exactly. So, or so ecological. to continue the story, why we're showing this? So, to each of the um, innovation cases that we mapped in EU, heritage-led innovation cases, we assigned pestle factors, and we found some interesting results. So, we wanted to kind of hear from you. What type of innovations do you think we found in Europe? Um, to see kind of if your idea reflects with what we found in, in practice. And it seems... Uh, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so ecological is unfortunately not there. Yeah, th there you're absolutely right. We are yeah. definitely lacking <laughs> biodiversity and ecological oriented um, innovations in the heritage field. So that definitely reflects what we found. Uh, technical slash technological, no? Uh, so that is a bit unexpected maybe. Yeah, exactly. We will show the, the results of our, finding, uh, of our findings in a bit, uh, but let's say uh, we can already give a small spoiler. Uh, you're a bit <laughs> presumptuous when it comes to political oriented um, innovations in the heritage field, because actually we almost found none. Yeah, so, so maybe you can <laughs> share what you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can share some cases, some examples, and then we can also include them there. Yeah, but yeah, more or less it is what we have found as well. Yeah. Social is always very present. Okay, so, so maybe uh, also to save time, because we were looking a bit at the clock in the previous presentations, um, we go to the slideshow. Um, and we, um, yeah, so again, that's me. <laughs> um, yeah, perfect. Um, and I will just very quickly run you through, what, am I doing it right? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm using the microphone. Um, quickly run you through some of the findings uh, that we did through our uh, long process of evidence-based research. Um, so again, you can find a lot more information in our innovation handbook, like out there in the coffee room, there is postcards with a QR code that you can just uh, go to our um, innovation handbook. Plus we are also currently developing and still uploading clips on our Elucidare to Learn channel, where you can find a recap of some of our findings. Uh, as background information, uh, how did we make this handbook? Like, there's a lot of die-hard research on economic development uh, theories, and we also collaborated with a group of about, I think, 15 actual innovator, practitioners, entrepreneurs in Europe to develop components of the handbook. All of the background research can also be found on the website. One of the observations that we had when we were looking for existing practices on heritage-led innovation is that basically you can always put them in three main groups. The groups are listed here. I will not go too much in detail, but basically the variables in the groups are uh, by who is the innovation developed, for whom is it developed, and more specifically, is it really a new innovation or is it just um, assimilating technologies or innovations that are already there into the heritage sector. Let's say these are kind of uh, the three main uh, variables for these groups. Um, then we thought that it would be cool to show uh, just some of, let's say, the more theoretical observations that we did uh, when looking at the 131 examples we found in the EU. So maybe just uh, interesting to know, heritage-led innovation is definitely a multiplayer game. It's not just um, a secluded lab where you put a patent on an idea. It's really people working together. Um, but interesting to know is that most of the case studies or examples that we found are usually smaller bottom-up ideas that come to life and they come from um, research institutions or educational um, sector. Then along the way, uh, we can see that more uh, civil society NGOs get involved and businesses. Uh, the main reason for this that we found is that you need more operational management knowledge or let's say user experience knowledge to actually keep ideas and innovations driving. So that's why they become more involved. And then along the way, so going from initiation to actors along the way, we see that government and public admi administration, they have a smaller role and they usually are also just like supporting role. It's not that they really take part in, in any of the innovations. Um, then where do these things take place? Um, I think it was interesting, well, it was not so much a surprise <laughs> to learn that a lot of the innovations we found are taking place in cities. Um, one of the core components of our definition is also uh, new ideas come from intersecting ideas, disciplines. I think it's kind of a natural feeling that this stuff happens in cities because it's just where people are coming together. 
um, it was very unfortunate to see that not a lot of the innovations we found were like in more rural areas or smaller villages, but we want to put a side note there. Um, we do believe that there is more examples out there, but we are also, <laughs> we lack some, I mean, Europe has a lot of languages basically. It's also not very easy for us to find and map everything, so we are convinced that there must be more and we do call everyone if you have, um, you know, knowledge on um, heritage-led innovation cases in more rural areas, do let us know. Then the, the columns <laughs> really on the right-hand side is like cross-state collaborations. We did put them there. Uh, these are basically, yeah, as the word says itself, collaboration between countries. Why are they so big and visible to us? They are usually EU-funded uh, projects or like uh, projects who get a lot of funding. So they are also required to put themselves out there uh, in terms of communication dissemination. Um, ah, then getting back to our <laughs> Mentimeter question, so this is actually what we found. Um, in our observations, so from all the cases that we mapped, um, indeed, like uh, Jimena said, we expected that social-oriented innovations would be very high up there, mm. but actually technical-oriented <laughs> um, innovations were a bit higher. What's the reason for this? I said in the beginning we found three main groups of the innovations and one of them is what we call uh, assimilation of innovations. There we talk about innovations that take um, existing information communication technologies and they basically uh, implement them for the heritage sector. These are often meant for uh, better outreach, communication, generating networks or building very cool educational uh, programs in Minecraft. Uh, but what we definitely see is, um, so the political oriented um, heritage led innovations are much lower than we also expected. But what we really, really hope to see in the future is that um, ecological oriented innovations will increase. And I put a, a small example um, in the end. Um, then um, before I add, this is yeah, something that I think we also wanted to mention. So. Um, when we talk about heritage-led innovations, um, we tend to live a bit in our small heritage sector niche thingy. So we also looked in terms of um, can they improve value for local communities or societies? And there the answer is yes. Um, the unfortunate, it's not unfortunate, but what we saw is that um, most of the return of such projects, such innovations, goes back to the heritage sector or heritage resources. So the actual, let's say, collaboration or interchange with other sectors, as you can see here, is quite small. And then I think it's not a very big surprise that those sectors where there is kind of an intersection are not the most innovative in themselves, it's mainly education and tourism. So that was quite uh, unfortunate to see. And then if you look at the graph on the right hand side, so that's like the spillover potential of these heritage-led innovations, um, there is spillover potential and actual cases where it happens, so that's good. Uh, the majority is still very much linked also to education and tourism, but there is also very good news because the projects that we did find that had the most spillover generation and the most revenue made are actually the ones not related to education and tourism. There is some oddballs out there, some very interesting project that actually uh, collaborate with different sectors and that tackle different topics and those are the ones that we found most interesting. Uh, we found some cool ones in real estate construction sector which was to be expected but then other sectors that we found was gaming. I think later on we'll also have uh, Fabio in this panel who will talk about a very cool project he did and then uh, two other um, let's say collaboration cross-sectoral um, events that we found was actually with ecology, with biodiversity, um, and one is specifically with medicine. Yeah. So let me just uh, show them. So the first one is called the Traditional Farm Building Grant Scheme. It's a project from Ireland. Um, <laughs> we nicknamed it Save the Bats, Save the Farms. Basically, um, about 350 buildings with thatched roofs were restored in uh, the rural areas of Ireland. Um, why were they restored? Because they had immense heritage value? No. They were restored because they're um, natural nesting areas for bats who are protected animals and who are endangered in the region. So the funds actually um, came from the Irish 
Department of Agriculture and Biodiversity, not from Heritage. So we found it a really cool interchange and collaboration. And then the second one uh, we nicknamed <laughs> Music Has Always Been Live. Um, it's basically, um, it was a, a system developed, a network, a closed network system, developed uh, initially for um, keeping alive European classical music. What's the best way to keep music alive? It's having people across Europe, across the globe, playing the music together. Um, actually, they started developing this pre-pandemic, <laughs> but it was um, actually operational during the pandemic. So it actually, it's a system with very low latency. It's like, it has a delay of less than uh, 0.1 milliseconds, and the quality is better than normal HDMI. So the system allows people from across the globe to play together perfectly. Now, the, um, it was developed by Sassanet, it's an association in Czech Republic, and eventually they also uh, started applying the same technology um, to conduct live medical surgeries, because um, actually the system they created is very low in bandwidth, because it's a closed network system. So that's again, we found a very interesting spillover to a sector that you would not immediately mm. expect from Heritage. Voilà. So this is uh, already in a nutshell to get you a bit warmed up for our innovation panel. And I think the people uh, who will explain the case studies there, they're also featured in our innovation handbook. We're just, yeah, we're very excited to, to have them here. And then I think we go to... The yeah, so we have another question. We want to test you, but no pressure. So we want to know, um, you can scan the code again, you know how it works, you can click the link for our online audience. And the question we will ask you is, uh, what is the most crazy link um, you can think between heritage and another sector, field or topic? Yeah, but, so but really mm -hmm. crazy, it can be something that you're in, is not working. Uh, I think you have the people in the technical or maybe you have to advance to the next question there. Yeah, so that's why. Yeah. Yeah? That was the most crazy. Oh, no, Reina. <laughs> <laughs> you can you also Reina. type a person's <laughs> name. <laughs> so it can be something that you already know, something that you have seen, or something that you are just thinking at the moment. Okay, this could be associated to heritage, and it's maybe something that you will not expect. Yeah, exactly. Just hearing us talk about, yeah, fashion, quantum physics, like it. Okay. <laughs> we want to space hear more about science. that, definitely. Let's go. Yeah, space heritage is also definitely a cool thing. Yeah, so do come talk to us about quantum physics and heritage. Now you got my interest. <laughs> <laughs> fashion, sport. Animal rights. Love. Oh, <laughs> Was that you, Georgia? <laughs> 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 Okay, yeah, relax music, ah, re, 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 remax music, okay, I would like to relax music. Animal, Animal rights, rights is actually also, I like it. That's, um, that's a cool way because again, we found some projects that lean towards biodiversity, um, natural heritage preservation, but they were very, very low. So we do uh, love to hear if you have any ideas about it. Um, Garden and nature also, sorry. Yeah, no, no, so because also just for you to know, so we heard uh, Tiago before, who was in uh, one of the, the summer schools, so the innovation handbook is not just results of the research, we also actually created a roadmap for people who have crazy ideas to use step by step to go from your idea to a first operational plan, you know, to how to do a pilot, who should be people you involve, um, what types of funding are there out there for um, heritage projects. So yeah, I mean, I'm loving a lot of these ideas. So we have a lot of crazy ideas indeed. That's, yeah. that's, that's really good. Wow. Yeah, so if there is some specific ones, just, just find us, talk to us about it, and, and we'll see, we'll ge definitely introduce you to Yeah, there are the a lot roadmap. of the ecological ones. That's, that's really nice to see, yeah. because we are lacking that. Okay, so I think I saw TikTok, and I know who, who wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Olympics, nice. Okay, it's so you can definitely you talk about this during the coffee breaks. You want to hear all of these ideas. If it's just something you have in your mind, use the roadmap, and then, yeah, we can continue sharing about this. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah, I will and now, yeah, we gladly give the floor to our colleague of um, the world-leading R&D company, IMEC. So, Heritin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Azilis Jimena, for uh, for the short presentation. 
So I have the pleasure, uh, good morning, I have the pleasure to uh, lead now the panel on um, heritage-led uh, innovation. Uh, we'll have two, present two short presentations, uh, two short reactions after afterwards. And uh, let us start with uh, Trevor White, um, who will be joining online in a moment. A director of the Little Museum in Dublin, uh, creator of the Blinder magazine, author of books. Trevor White, you have the floor now. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Great. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here this morning. I'm thrilled to be here and um, look forward to participating. Um, what I'm going to do over the next uh, few minutes is really tell you a little bit about the development of the uh, institution uh, that I work in. Uh, it's called the Little Museum of Dublin. It is a people's museum of the city of Dublin. And I suppose what makes it somewhat unusual is that it has a collection that was created entirely by people's, uh, by, by donations from the public, uh, by public donations, um, the whole collection. The museum is, is 10 years old. Uh, we go to the next slide, please. I'll just show you a little bit about it. This is what it looks like uh, inside. Uh, we established the museum uh, in 2011, and you'll remember there was a there was a recession in Ireland at that point. Um, the International Monetary Fund had a hand in running our economy. It was uh, quite a difficult time in Irish history, and civic pride was very low. And I decided to open this museum uh, really to try and enhance civic pride. And I define civic pride as the amount of affection that a place has for itself. Um, and I suppose that was our core goal, really, along with increasing public understanding of the history of our city. Uh, and of course, the fact that Dublin at that point didn't have a city museum of its own is itself evidence of the relatively low self-esteem or uh, civic pride that there was in the city at the time. So we went to our city government and we asked them to uh, uh, allow us to use a building, a vacant building that they owned in the center of the city. And they said, uh, well, we'll give you, uh, we'll give you, thank you. Uh, that's where it is, right, right beside St. Stephen's Green, if, which if you've been to Dublin, you, you'll remember is in the very center of the city. Um, this is the building you're looking at here on screen now. And they said to us, our city government said, well, you can have two rooms uh, on the uh, on the first floor, uh, and they said you can have them for eleven months, and you can see how how you get on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we opened the museum, and we asked people to donate material, and we got some extraordinary things. We got a a, a proclamation, uh, which is the founding document of the Irish state, which you see on the left. But we also got things, thousands of things, uh, with no real. Uh, economic value, but huge emotional value and emotional resonance uh, for our visitors. So the badges on the right uh, were given out when you went to see Santa Claus in a local department store. Uh, and today, I'm pleased to say there are over 5,000 uh, artifacts uh, in our uh, collection, the vast majority uh, of them donated by the people of the city. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, just a quick overview in relation to our, our, our policy guidelines. At present, we only accept donations only um, because we're really trying to create a public collection you know, held in trust for the people uh, of the city. Uh, next slide, please. So there are really three things that happen uh, in the Little Museum of Dublin, and I suppose um, you know, we, we boil them down to these three things uh, in order to, um, you know, for our own internal benefit, but also in terms of our external messaging, this is quite important. So the three things are history, which is our subject, the history of our city. Uh, our goal is to promote public understanding of the history of our city. Uh, hospitality is the second thing. It's a big theme in everything we do. Uh, the Irish uh, well, we like to think we're famous for our hospitality, maybe we're not, um, but we want the museum to epitomize that tradition of great hospitality. So for us, we take, ex we take our inspiration 
typically not from other museums, uh, but from five-star hotels. So when you walk into a five-star hotel, um, you, you'll realize that somebody's going to make eye contact with you very quickly. Someone will smile at you. You'll be welcomed. Um, so, 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 so as I say, we have the same sort of values uh, in relation to hospitality. We really believe that museums should provide a, um, an example of first-class Irish uh, hospitality. And then the third thing that kind of informs our work is humour. And when I say humour, I mean the salty humour of Dublin. I mean the uh, I mean uh, the gift of the gab, this ability to talk uh, at great length sometimes. Uh, and all of our visitors come on a guided tour uh, of the museum collection. The guided tour is very theatrical. Uh, it's, it's very humorous. It's only 29 minutes long, so it's really designed for people who are not professional historians, but really uh, for locals who have a sort of a, a, a little bit of interest in history and also visitors to our city who want a kind of a top line introduction uh, to Irish history and they want it quickly. Um, and that was a kind of a key insight really for us, uh, this uh, awareness that modern audiences uh, really, you, you, we are spoiled. You know that's the truth. You know we have we have so many uh, different ways to spend our time and money. And museums ultimately, are, I believe that museums are ultimately competing uh, with shopping centres and cinemas and parks for your attention. Uh, and once we get you into the building, we have an obligation to keep you entertained. Uh, and the education bit. The public understanding of history that's really important but we almost do it uh, in secret uh, by using these devices using warm hosp hospitality using laughter uh, and comedy uh, to try and uh, get people uh, interested uh, in our subject uh, next slide please um, so our vision is really very simple. We want to create the best small city museum in the world. Uh, we believe there's an opportunity to create something uh, that has an international reputation for the quality uh, of uh, the experience, really the visitor experience. Uh, we've actually stopped using the word visitor altogether. We now use the word guest uh, in, in deference, uh, again, to that tradition within hotels of treating people like valued uh, visitors to your home, valued guests to your own home. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm mindful that I've gone on and on. I've only got a couple of minutes left, so we probably won't get to the end here. But just to tell you, uh, our mission uh, is really to create awareness of our history uh, with stories, uh, with objects, and with powerful shared experiences in a world-class uh, city museum. So that's really it uh, in a sentence. Next slide, please. Um, again, our purpose are to remember our history, share it with the world, and to build civic pride. And again, we keep going back to civic pride uh, because I think it's a hugely important uh, metric. Uh, these are our strategic objectives, uh, again, which build on uh, the, these, these, uh, these, these three insights. Uh, next, next slide, please, just to show you a little bit of the work that we're doing. So uh, we do everything from guided tours every half an hour of the building uh, to talks and lectures. We have temporary exhibitions. Uh, we have a lot of programs which are designed to bring in uh, audiences uh, to the museum who mightn't always feel uh, particularly uh, welcome in museums. Uh, so, for example, uh, we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, for example, uh, oh, incidentally, this is a, a kind of a, a, a an example of the kind of the programming that we've done, um, where we we have huge emphasis on diversity. We try to reach brand new audiences with our temporary uh, exhibition program. Next slide, please. Uh, just in relation to the diversity around the programming, uh, you'll see in the bottom left on this slide that we've introduced a weekly Irish sign language tour uh, for people who are hard of hearing. Uh, on the top left, you see a mural uh, which we've just uh, launched in the museum, which tells the story of the first woman uh, from the traveller community uh, who has become a, Senate, uh, a senator uh, in the Irish uh, Parliament. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, the emphasis really is on telling stories that haven't been told before or haven't been told uh, particularly well. This is slightly out of date. Uh, and it's really just a little bit of backslapping. It's, it's uh, us 
uh, reminding ourselves that, that we're doing, we must be doing something right. Uh, and uh, here you get a sense of our visitor numbers, obviously, uh, pre-pandemic, um, things were pretty good. We got up to 120,000 visitors uh, in 2019. And that's from a, a low of 25,000, just over 25,000 in our first year. So you see it's grown quite dramatically. And then of course, uh, the pandemic uh, intervenes. This is a s overview of our uh, governance uh, who's on the team. Next slide, please. Um, and again, this is a big question for us. How do we grow and measure civic pride? It's very easy to see the impact in the short term because uh, kids, for example, come in to the museum and they leave and they're walking a little bit taller than they were when they came in. But I suppose what I'm really interested in now is trying to measure the long-term impact of a museum visit or a series of museum uh, visits. Um, and if you can help me do that, if anybody wants to help me, please, please get in touch. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a certificate in museum studies that we've introduced. We also have a paid six month fellowship. If anybody's interested, get in touch with us, uh, please. Um, which is a six month introduction to the business of running uh, a museum and it's great fun. And uh, we have very nice people uh, on our team. Next slide, please. And this is the Museum Standards Programme, uh, which is run by the uh, Irish government, <clears throat> which we've just become uh, accredited on, I I'm pleased to say. Uh, next slide, please. Just a breakdown of our visitor numbers. You see uh, that over half of our visitors uh, are English speaking. However, we do want to, uh, we do want to develop new audiences. Uh, so my project uh, over lockdown was to turn, was to learn a guided tour uh, en Francais, uh, and I, we now give a tour every morning uh, in French uh, for visitors in the museum, I'm pleased to say, at 10.30. Next slide, please. Um, this is just uh, an overview of the different uh, initiatives and revenue streams that we have uh, within uh, our building. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, an overview of the kind of work that we were doing uh, around the pandemic. Obviously, when the museum museums were closed, it was a very challenging time for museums, uh, and we wanted to stay relevant. Uh, so we created a pretty busy program uh, online uh, for the benefit of our uh, our, our audiences. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, just to conclude, uh, just to reiterate, this is what our goal is. We want to become the best small city museum in the world. It's a, it's a big goal. Uh, it's audacious. Um, you may think it's ridiculous, um, but for us, it keeps us very focused. Everything that we do uh, brings us back uh, to this goal to become the best small city museum uh, in the world. We're not there yet, but uh, I hope to be one day. Thank you very much for your time uh, and attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I will call to the floor uh, the next speaker, Fabio Viola. I will also call um, the, the people who are going to react, Pascal Lievo, Cecile Huppert, if you want to join us on stage. That would be nice. I guess you will need that one. Thank you. Um, also something I forgot to say in the, in the, the beginning, uh, there will be of course a little time in the end for a discussion uh, between the speakers, uh, but also if there, are, if there is any question from the audience, I understand that questions will also be gathered from the online feed, so don't hesitate to, 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 to write in there if you have anything, we will find a little bit of time in the end for, for all of this. Uh, Fabio Viola, you are a game designer. Uh, you've uh, worked uh, previously at Electronic Arts Mobile and Vivendi Games. Now you're a designer for several EU-funded projects. You founded the International Collective of Artists to Museo, specializing in the intersection of gaming and cultural heritage. The floor is yours. Thanks for inviting me here. Um, I grew up in the 80s in a small town in the south of Italy, playing video games and loving archaeology. But at that time, my parents blessed me for the passion about history, but at the same time, they hated me for playing video games. Mm, for them, video games were a waste of time, especially money. Uh, but I decided to continue on that road, and I attended the archaeology at university. At the same time, I founded a startup, a video games-based startup, at 22. Um, 
have having the privilege to work with electronic cars or with Endion, FIFA, The Sims, SimCity, designing these kind of games, but even if I reach the economical self-sustainability and my parents were finally happy, at least from this point of view, people around me still conceive video games as a technology-based industry and something not related to the culture, to the heritage, to the what is serious in the life. And at that point, I decide to try to connect the dots of my life, funding um, a collective of artists. We are, right now, we are 22. So we are 22 employees, uh, in mixed with pe mixing with people coming from a traditional humanistic background, people who study archaeology, art history, and, um, I don't know, tourism, and others are coming from video games industry. So game developers, game musicians, game designers, game artists. Hold, we are all together working since in 2016. This company has been funded thanks to a grant from a banking foundation in Italy. Uh, they, give, they gave us several money to start, otherwise it was impossible uh, to, to start a new market. And uh, right now, Tomuseo is working with a lot of museums, theaters, municipalities, governments in Italy and abroad. And what we think is what you can read, it's a provocative, of course. Cultural institutions should look at Fortnite, Minecraft, Candy Crush, but even Netflix or Spotify as models, but above all as rivals, enriching, engaging, transferring knowledge, and even creating economically sustainable experiences. It sounds strange, of course, but maybe you are questioning how it's possible that the video game is, com is challenging with museums, with theaters, with public libraries, but yeah, I guess we can learn at least three main things, studying video games and the relationship between video games and heritage. First of all, today video games represent an important cultural and artistic expression. Uh, they have entered inside the permanent collection in museums all around the world. Vertical muse video games museums are born all over the world, and they are an, an embodied evidence of new intangible uh, heritage. Still now, it's the art, I consider video games the 10 art form. We can produce statues, paintings, architectures, but even video games. It's a digital frame, of course, but it's a kind of meta art. Right now, I, I didn't explain before, I ended up working as leading curator for Royal Building of Venaria in Torino. So I started in video games, and now I'm curating traditional kind of things, or, or maybe trying to mix the past with the future. So this is the first thing, but I, I didn't give I didn't deep inside this topic. True, through the lens of video games audiences, over 2.5 billion people worldwide play annually, we can learn a lot, a lot about how designing, engaging, memorable, and relevant experiences. So the main question is how come at least 3 billion people play annually video games and just a fraction of that people enter inside a traditional cultural institution? We are losing the challenge right now. And last but not least, video games and gamification, let's say, let's use this term, represent an extraordinary tool to support cultural policies in terms of audience development, audience engagement, transferring knowledge, and above all, bringing the museum outside the museum. We are 100% focused on what happens when people enter inside our spaces, inside the museum, inside the city, inside the small town. But the real challenge is how to bring the content, the values of those places outside anytime, anytime anywhere in the life of people. So changing our mind from the idea of cultural attractor to idea to cultural activations. I'm not interested at all in cultural attractors right now. The challenge is how to activate people outside the places. And I want to like one of the projects we took care. Uh, it's a 2017 project funded by the Archaeological Museum of Naples, and probably is, this is the first video games published by a museum for a worldwide audience. What I mean for a worldwide audience. The game is available 
on several stores. It's available in 11 languages, including Napoleon dialect, because they consider uh, a language. It's a kind of mix between Spanish and uh, Italian, Chinese, Japanese, okay, Russian, English, uh, so on. Um, and I want to share with you the, the trailer. I don't know if you can play that. Just a post mortem after years. Um, okay, let's let me go ahead. I want to show you the the data. Um, we we reached five million people. Five million people downloaded this game just to create a, compar a comparison with the physical museum. In the, in the same amount of time, the museum has been physically visited by one million of people. Um, the average age of gamers is 33 years old. Still now, people think about video games as uh, children activities, but the average age worldwide of people who buy video games is around 35, 37. And the age is growing up because when people like me is getting older and older, we continue to play. So in the next years, probably the average age would be 60 or something like that. Um, and 30% of gamers are female of this kind of product. Only 7% of download comes from Italy. It might be strange, but it's not, because in Italy we are 60 million and worldwide we are 80 billion or something like that. So when we create digital kind of experiences, the, um, the set is the word. I mean, it's pretty much useless to create digital experience for local communities. We use physical activities for engaging local communities, and we agreed with the director of Museum Archaeology of Naples, Paolo Giuliorini, for when people are inside the museum, we use physical tools because f physical tools with synesthesia are pretty much better compared to digital ones. We use digital to reach worldwide kind of audience and for interaction pre and post experiences, of course. And okay, you can see there. Uh, okay, collectively, people have spent almost 1,000 years inside the game, inside exposed to the to the brand, let's say that, in marketing terms. And we, we, we got more than 80,000 80, reviews in this amount of time. And totally on TripAdvisor, the museum has around 80,000, so per 10, the multiplicator. But the, the most in interesting thing, I guess, of course, this is a digital product, so you can play uh, the game on your couch in Bangladesh and you can complete the experience, but just if you physically visit the, the Archaeological Museum of Naples, the application recognized through GPS that you are there inside and you can unlock additional extra contents. So it's a way to gap the bridge between physical and digital experiences. And we had more than 70,000 people who paid 15 euros. So moving from the video games to the physical place, it's around 1 million euro in extra revenues for the museum. And that's what, and this fact helped me to explain this concept. Often museum directors or public entities are scared about the cost of technology. It's true, technology has a cost, but the real question is, I'm going to earn in terms of social, cultural, and even economical impact using that technologies. All the project, uh, both as private company and now as people who works inside the public entities, has this in mind. Okay, we introduce technologies, I don't know what, it's based on the context, but they should be at least partially self-sustainable. 
economy. Otherwise, technology dies after a few months because they need a lot of updates from hardware and software perspective. So people have to be, ha we, ha we have to create something that people are happy to pay for. So this is a great challenge, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. The last, uh, just no, the the last one. Uh, no, this I skip. Just this is the next big exhibition we are going to lead in Venaria Reale, Royal Palace. It's called Play. It's we can find something like that. Uh, okay, this is a short circuit between old things and let's say new things. But especially, this is a packaging of video games, Ico, made by Sony. It's a inspired by old artists like the Kiriko, and we have real the Kiriko on the same wall and video games, or we have Kandinsky, a real Kandinsky, and at the same time we are two frames from these video games, rats. I talked with the Japanese creative, and they have been inspired by Kandinsky. So that's what I want to say is uh, old, man old artworks are inspiring next generation of creative, but often they are not accessible or creative don't have a chance to access to this kind of content. So we have to create this two bi-directional way. I mean, new creative have to be inspired by old artworks, but at the same time, museums need creative and new languages to let their artworks survive in the next future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ah, okay, yes, <laughs> it's finished. I give the floor to uh, Pascal Liveau for the first reaction, uh, leading the department piloting uh -huh. research in the Dir Director General for Heritage and Architecture at the French Ministry of Culture, uh, chairing the JPICH European Joint Program Initiative on Cultural Heritage. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, I will try to react with my poor English and uh, I apologize for it. Uh, but uh, these uh, two last presentations and the two previous ones were very, very inspiring. And I would like to react, uh, trying to see the links uh, between these innovations and uh, research in the field of heritage science, what we call today heritage science. So, um, may, as you maybe know, uh, the JPI Cultural Heritage has upload its uh, strategic research and innovation agenda uh, in 2020. You can uh, read it on the Heritage uh, Research Hub, uh, which is a platform uh, dedicated to professionals and uh, scientists to share information. So please uh, uh, use the Heritage Research Hub. And um, so, um, if I, um, if I look at the seven underlying principles we have uh, identified uh, together, 18 countries, European countries, for making cultural heritage a powerful resource for uh, innovation, um, the first principle is the uh, holistic approach of uh, cultural heritage, and we have seen it uh, in, uh, in movement in these uh, four presentations. Uh, meaning um, taking together um, uh, tangible, intangible heritage, um, digital heritage, and also their relation with natural heritage. And, and this holistic approach is very stimulating and uh, uh, very, very important. Um, we have seen, for instance, in Dublin, uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Uh, this little museum is, is, is a very good example of uh, artifacts uh, that do make sense in combination of their tangible forms and intangible stories and meaning uh, behind, and uh, fabricated by local uh, people. And uh, I think a video game can one day become a heritage object, and uh, I can tell you, Fabio, uh, it is truly culture, a and maybe one day uh, an, uh, um, a heritage, cultural heritage artifact. In some, in some years. So the second principle is collaborative and transdisciplinary approach. And uh, we have seen it also in these different uh, examples, meaning involving a wide range of actors, um, of course, heritage professionals, uh, scientists, but also NGOs, 
uh, associations, citizens, uh, artists, uh, and a, a broad range of heritage institutions and management bodies. Uh, and also working across disciplinary, conceptual, theoretical, methodological, and international boundaries. Um, in both cases, we have seen the association of uh, heritage professionals with other actors, uh, specialists in video games or inhabitants of a territory whose history they share. And uh, it illustrates the necessary crossing of uh, skills and culture. That's one of the main conditions for innovation. Um, and in research programs, it, it is still not enough done, in my opinion. So we have uh, to act uh, better in the future. A third principle is um, public-led research and uh, community engagement work as catalysts for innovation and a greater impact. And here again, these two case studies demonstrate how different forms of citizen engagement can contribute to offer innovative solutions uh, for improving cultural heritage resilience. Uh, one by attracting through video games new publics to uh, cultural heritage, the other one by involving communities in uh, the making of cultural heritage and in the safeguard of a certain kind of cultural heritage by uh, creating knowledge and narratives through participatory approaches. And the fourth one is digital. Uh, digital is everywhere, it's a very powerful tool for innovation and um, it's contributing to better knowledge, conservation and transmission and in this aspect serious games can be a way to initiate young people to cultural heritage uh, provided that their content is based on scientific uh, knowledge and that's very important but we can see uh, too many video games using heritage, cultural heritage as a um, pretext we see in French, I don't know if it's the right word in English, uh, um, for, uh, for the game, but with no real interest in, uh, in cultural heritage. And a, a fifth principle is education and training. And uh, there are also paramount aspects of innovation to inspire a new generation of innovators across Europe. Uh, through capacity building, it has been said, and formal and informal learning opportunities, in particular for young people, and the two projects presented have obviously an educational value. The sixth principle is communication, dissemination, and impact, uh, in particular by reaching uh, young people uh, and hard to reach communities, uh, which again these two case studies have managed to do, apparently with uh, success. And the last principle is maybe less relevant here, but it's also important to avoid duplication and to avoid constantly reinventing the wheel in the field cultural heritage where resources we know we all know are, are still scarce and limited. And it is this principle is to work with other projects, in initiatives and infrastructures in Europe and beyond. And this is why the JPI Cultural Heritage some years ago has responded positively to Iluchidare, to their proposal uh, to, to work together, and we, we intend to continue the collaborations in, in new forms uh, now. And through these different approaches, we have seen that the study of cultural heritage can become a powerful catalyst of innovation, um, and also with innovative solutions developed specifically and tailored-made for cultural heritage, but also becoming a resource for developing and transferring innovative solutions in other domains. We have seen uh, through the survey. Um, uh, I think we can disprove the result of the survey uh, on uh, ecology, because um, it, it's for the JPI cultural heritage a very important topic. We are working with another JPI, the JPI climate, uh, we have uh, written a white paper, you can also discover in the Heritage Science uh, Hub. And um, uh, I believe uh, uh, the innovation potential of joint uh, initiative in this domain is uh, very important. Um, 
The, the white paper is called Cultural Heritage and Climate Change, New Challenges and Perspectives for Research. And um, we are aiming to launch a joint transnational call uh, in 2023. So it's, uh, it's an information I, I give you. And um, mm -hmm. yes, I have finished. Thank you. And it, no, it was to say that, uh, as it has been said just uh, previously, uh, the research and innovation in our field can be of great interest for many other important social, uh, environmental, economical uh, topics. So it can help us to, uh, to uh, give responses to these big challenges. Thank you. Uh, Cecil Luper for the last uh, reaction from Eurocities, uh, working as project coordinator, specializing in European funded projects, primarily on local cultural policies, creativity, cultural heritage projects. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for all the nice presentations. Indeed, they were very inspiring and I found them also very moving. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, with this reaction, I just wanted to reflect a bit on maybe what we mean with innovation uh, in regards to the two case studies that were presented uh, in this session and what I found innovative about them. So the first thing uh, is, the, as Trevor said, I think in his presentation, they were quite unusual, which is something I, I really appreciated. Um, the Little Museum of Dublin, for instance, is not about well-known artists or famous art, but really about the people in the big history, uh, who they are, what they did, what they felt, these kind of things. So the emotional value of this uh, story was uh, very uh, close to my heart. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate also that we give also the voice uh, to the people who are not necessarily heard in the big, uh, in the big macro landscape. And then uh, Fabio's uh, story also, the first uh, world first video game produced by a museum. So I guess when it came out, it was very unusual, unexpected, um, very serious and not useless at all. Then the second thing I found innovative is that these uh, two stories have an impact. They are very impactful, not only on the visitors or the guests, as uh, Trevor mentioned, but also on the people who made them or made them come true. So in the case of Dublin, all the museum ambassadors, uh, the people whose stories are featured in the museum, the local guides. So they really managed to create a community around the museum and increase the civic pride, as uh, Trevor said. And uh, the father and son game is uh, interesting because it talks a bit about the spillovers that were mentioned by Aziliz and Rimena. Uh, this combination of uh, professional competencies um, and a large array of skills that is needed to make this uh, come true. And finally, I found them very inspiring as well. Um, so the Little Museum of Dublin took really a people-centered approach uh, to heritage, create uh, relevant experiences in doing so, combining and integrating a collaborative approach to the preservation and, and presentation of cultural heritage while entertaining the public and making us laugh. Let's not forget that we need to laugh also. Uh, and then father and son, um, I have to say in, in preparation of the event, I have downloaded the game and I play it. So first of all, it was very nice homework. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then I'm part of your statistics now. <laughs> um, and I really love that the, the stories were embedded into each other, that each of the stories in the game were very touching as well. Uh, and now I want to go to Naples as well to unlock parts of my game. Uh, so it's great that uh, you managed to reach out to me, would never went to Naples. Um, and it's great also to know that we can indeed learn by, by playing. I think it's, it's Tiago who, who said that before. Uh, playing is learning and that's very reassuring and very motivating as well. So that's uh, all I, I wanted to tell you um, in reaction to this panel. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, do we? No, we, we still have time for questions. Yeah, we still have a bit of time. We, we we postponed slightly the, the, the start of the coffee break. Uh, so we have time for questions, if there is any question. Um, but maybe already the, the presenters want to react to the reactions. <laughs> uh, Fabio, I don't know if you want to say something already, or Trevor, I, yes, you are online. You want to say something already, or should we wait for the... I, I ah, yeah. just want to say thank you very much. <laughs> 
if I may. Uh, just uh, thank you for engaging with our work. And it's uh, such a privilege to be able to share um, you know, what we're doing in Dublin uh, with, with, with yourselves. Um, and thank you for your very sensitive and thoughtful responses. OK, thanks. I look forward to visiting you. <laughs> You'll yeah. be very welcome. <laughs> Um, any question? While we are waiting for questions, I have, a, well, actually I have a lot, but um, okay, if I only have only one. Um, to the two of you, when did you realize that you were really doing an innovation? Um, and I'm not, so there's the aspect of, okay, I'm doing something new, but also something that is really, uh, that has an impact that is uh, of important for some, because of course, in, probably in your case, it's more obvious, it's, it's new. But when you realize, yes, it is innovative, it is legitimate in the field. And of course, the question also goes for you, uh, Trevor. If you want to start, apparently. OK, um, I can start. I recognize the value of what we did when we started receiving emails and even written letters from the players uh, that from rethinking about their relationship with their fathers, because the main story is about a missing relationship between a son and his father. And so they wrote me a lot of letters from, I don't know, India, Pakistan, China, people of, uh, I decide to, to meet again my father. Uh, when my father will, will go back from the prison, uh, I want to stay with him. So I, there I understood that we touched people. And when people are touched, when people are emotionally connected with any kind of experiences, probably we are open the doors to the transferring knowledge. I, I might just add to that. I mean, I totally agree. I really think it's about creating that emotional connection. And for me, I suppose the moment I realized that, that it, was, it was having, the work was having an impact was one day when in the museum, I approached a gentleman, an elderly gentleman and I said, uh, you know, you're very welcome uh, to the museum. I said, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Dublin. And I said, well, you know, this is your museum. He said, uh, I know this is my third time that I've been here. Uh, and this was after about a year or 18 months that we'd been open. And he was quite sort of upset. You know, he was, you know, not that impressed that I was asking him. But I came away and, and I realized that that was exactly the kind of experience that we were trying to create. We wanted the people of the city to take ownership of the work and to create, as you say, this emotional connection uh, to the work. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm pleased to say that we are connecting uh, with our local audience as well as our visitor, visitors uh, in this uh, emotional and playful way. Is this how you, is this how, sorry, you see your, your long-term impact then? Because you, you, you asked the question about uh, this, and uh, now you, that's really what you are referring to also now, right? We have a question here. Uh, it's for Trevor. Ah, um, I think we need to tell the mic so uh, people online can hear you. Hi, okay. Um, thank you to both of you, uh, very inspired by the, the presentations. Trevor, in relation to uh, measuring civic pride, uh, do you currently have a research project that will document kind of, you know, the baseline or a baseline from some point? And as you become the best, smallest, small museum in the world, like, are you actively doing that work now or do you plan to? What I'd really like to do is to develop a relationship with an academic partner. Um, we have, to answer your question, we have done some basic research within the museum. Uh, but frankly, I'm not a statistician. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, my own background is the media. I feel very much like a, 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 uh, an interloper uh, in the heritage world. Um, so I would love to develop a formal relationship with an academic partner, whether it's a university or... Uh, so, uh, another institution that can help us to measure in the long term uh, the impact. Um, but as I said, you know, we have 
I can tell you the short term impact, absolutely. Um, but it's uh, it's the, it's this long term impact. So no is the answer. We don't have a formal um, uh, long term project in place. And I'd love to uh, talk to you if you uh, are interested in, in partnering with us. Do we have any more questions in the room? Um, so my name is Koen van Bijlen from K Leuven. Um, Thank you very much for your presentations, and I think I want to echo a little bit about the first question that uh, the moderator was asking for. Um, sometimes it sounds easy to start something and to be innovative and to be inspired, and I would ask both of you, what are, do you see as the most um, important challenges in continuing this? Yeah? Because one thing is to start and to be inspiring, and it's more easy probably to get certain attention, but how do you see the challenges, uh, the possibilities, or the, uh, the um, not only the challenges, but maybe the visions that you may have about uh, continuing this uh, with the same feeling of, of, of inspiration and, and, uh, and innovation? Uh, oh, uh, okay, I can start. I mean, practically, we are working on the sequel, so the video game is becoming like a telenovelas. So, <laughs> yeah, next, uh, at the end of the May, but uh, I mean, um, aside the jokes, but it's true that we are releasing the sequel. I think the, the main challenge is, is the legacy of what we are doing, because yeah, it's a partnership public pri with a private company. Okay, we are there, we, we bring on board new things, new visions, uh, new technical skills too, but at a certain point, we go out, of course, because we, can, we don't stay there forever. And at that point, it's up to the museum directors, curators, to continue or not uh, that vision. And usually, in my experience, they don't continue, of course, because they have other things, other priorities, let's say that, other kind of problems to, to handle. But just a small kind of solution is to, for example, in father and son, we made an agreement uh, for which we, we take care about the brand. We are the owner of Father and Son brand. Uh, we can earn more money from that game. For example, we, we, we sold assets to Chinese people. We sold uh, the script, the screenwriting to a theater company that paid us, and the game became even a, a theater play. But in, in exchange of that, we guarantee after five years the manutention of the game, the preservation of the game. In fact, you can still download after five years. So it's a sm small kind of compensation just to survive the product, but it's just a starting, because public entities can handle by themselves these new sites. Trevor, do you want to react? Sure, I would, just, I, I would just say that uh, I, I am personally, I'm a very uh, tenacious person. I'm very, I, I'm very driven. I, 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 I see a target and I go for the target. But that's my only good quality, unfortunately. Uh, but happily, I'm surrounded by very smart people uh, and on, on our team, but also among our stakeholders. Uh, our government, our city government has been very supportive uh, of our work and then our national governments as well. Um, so we've built a very, very large uh, team of people who want the work uh, to succeed. Um, and I suppose my, my good fortune, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky really just to be surrounded by people who are much smarter than me uh, to keep the, you know, to help us to grow uh, the thing. But you do need a vision and you do need tenacity, you, need, you, you know, to get a cultural institution off the ground, particularly uh, like us, when you had, we had no money at all, uh, we, we launched with a, a grant of 40,000 euro uh, from our tourist board, and um, you know, we built it from there. Thank you. Philip? Yeah, thank you. Philip Cairn from uh, KEA. I'd like actually to build on the answers of Trevor and, and, and try to understand from, from you, Fabio, and Trevor, uh, what has been the impacts of your initiatives on policies because obviously you, are, you, you work with the cultural institutions uh, or with policy with local authorities. You are reinventing the museum in such a way or the, the, uh, the engagement with citizens and museum. You are, you, are, you are reviewing how a cultural institution could work in the future and how heritage can be 
uh, a tool for, uh, uh, for, for the development of the city. And I'd, I'd like to, from your point of view, what has been the, the policy impact of your initiative and how, and how do you see this uh, uh, policy impact being, uh, 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 I'd say, uh, uh, how, how policy could, could go further to actually support this type of initiative and help you to grow those initiatives and maybe help other cultural institutions, whether museum or, or Philharmonia or other institutions to, to make the most of your, uh, of your uh, endeavors. Okay, uh, I start. Mm. for example, in Italy after that game, uh, several institutions started hiring game designers. So right now we have municipalities that hired game designers to, to help them to construct the new city, the city of the future or the museum of the future. So we have this kind of cases and the public uh, government started thinking about game commissions, for example, to handle the game-based tourism for the first time. You know, we have movie-based tourism, but in the 21st century we have a lot of game-based tourism, but it's not regulated or handled or fostered by a public government. So in, in Italy, several, several things started, even included several university courses about gaming for culture or, let's say, engagement for museums. So something is happening, and the new generation of expert is growing up and helping the institution to rethink about their self. Trevor? Um, so I have two answers to that question. Uh, I suppose the big answer is that uh, in Ireland, uh, we, have a, we still have a challenge to convince government that investing in culture makes sense. We still have to win that economic argument um, it, with policymakers. Uh, you know, to in improve investment in cultural heritage and in the arts. Uh, our investment is relatively low compared to yourselves, you know, our, many of our uh, European brothers and sisters. You live in countries where your governments, you may think it's small, but I promise you our investment is smaller still. We're one of the lowest government investment uh, in, in arts and culture and heritage. Uh, having said that, on... Uh, I'm extremely lucky to work in an institution which enjoys the support of our local government and our national government. And I suppose in terms of an output, you know, you asked about an output in terms of a policy, policy shift. Perhaps the simple answer to that question is simply to tell you that uh, next week, uh, hopefully next week, uh, I will sign a 35 year lease uh, in the building that the museum occupies, uh, which is owned by our city government. Uh, now that's after 10 years of, of experimenting and, 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 and trying to prove that the model works, uh, but it does demonstrate that our city government, uh, you know, who's our most important stakeholder, uh, you know, recognizes the value of the work and has decided to invest uh, in the long term by giving us a very generous lease of, you know, very small rent uh, for the next 35 years. Um, thank you. Uh, we are approaching to the end of the session, so we uh, have a few more minutes for uh, questions. So I would like to ask uh, people in the other room if uh, they have any question or comment before the break. If there's no question, I have one question. If there's no question, <laughs> I have a question from our online audience, uh, and then I will give the floor okay, no, uh, to you. We have a few minutes. Uh, the question is uh, for uh, Fabio. Um, the, the online audience would like to know if you have been influenced by uh, um, any existing games for uh, this work uh, that you have been doing, and uh, by which? Yeah. Absolutely, I'm pretty much obsessed with uh, the power of narrative in video games. So for me, video games as a language, and so I played a lot of narrative kind basic games like, I don't know, Life is Strange, The Last of Us, and of course, all our games are narrative based. So mm -hmm. yes, definitely, we continue what we play. Uh, it's a question for Trevor. Uh, after 10 years, do you have now to face uh, uh, conservation and restoration uh, problems <laughs> because you have such a multiplicity of objects and <laughs> mm. 
materials? It's, it's a very good question. Uh, it's a problem that we have. It's a problem I'm happy to have. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Any last question then? We have actually a few minutes. No. Otherwise, I think we can go to the coffee break. I would um, like to, to thank a lot the, 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 the panel, the presenters, the, the reactions. Um, thank you, thank you very much to our panelists, uh, moderator, and to, to you for your uh, questions and uh, your interest. We will now have a, a short uh, break, so we will be back at 11.50, so uh, also our uh, online audience can uh, grab a cup of coffee, and we will meet in 20 minutes uh, back in the room. I remind uh, uh, the online audience to keep uh, writing in the chat, keep sending uh, your questions. We, we read you and we will uh, reply to you when we are back. Have a nice break and thank you very much. <laughs>